The Gulf Coast is a land where sunshine mingles with shadow, a place with a beautiful landscape and a pretty grim past. And that's why we have so many myths and legends down here. I guess when you mix that much beauty with that much tragedy, you're bound to get some serious spooky tales. These stories, often a wild mix of the bizarre, the horrifying, and told with a dash of dark humor, have been part of our fabric since day one. They've been whispered around campfires, shared in hushed tones in dimly lit rooms, and passed down from generation to generation, making sure they never really die. Just 26 miles north of Baton Rouge, in the sleepy little town of St. Francisville, you've got one of America's most haunted spots, the Myrtles Plantation. Built in 1796 by Revolutionary War General David Bradford, this place looks like something out of a southern fairy tale. But let's just say the vibes are way darker than the picturesque oak trees and wraparound porch let on. You know how there are haunted house tours where you get to walk through and hear some spooky stories and maybe feel a draft. Well, this was like that, but cranked up to 11, where you're constantly second guessing if that draft was actually something dead and annoyed. We start on the porch, cause where else would you start when you're about to be ushered into a haunted mansion, right? Charles, our guide, steps out of the shadows like he's auditioning for the role a mysterious caretaker, ringing this bell that's somehow way too loud for its size. He's not wasting any time either, just jumps straight into the rules, like no flash photography, no video, and definitely no provoking what you can't control, which you know is comforting? So Charles leads us into the Myrtles, and right away, this place feels wrong. You ever walk into a house and just immediately feel like you're not supposed to be there? Like the walls are secretly side-eyeing you? Yeah, it's that vibe. Charles starts telling us the story of Chloe. So Chloe is this poor slave girl who ends up having an affair with Clark Woodruff here. The absolute worst, because of course. She's basically stuck between a rock and a hard place, a fair or field labor. And then, because no one in this story is good at handling drama, Clark's like, oh, you were eavesdropping. Guess I'll just cut off your ear. Casual, right? Now Chloe's walking around with this green turban, trying to cover up the missing ear like no big deal. Except it is a big deal, because Chloe decides she's going to get back at the family with some light poisoning. Not to kill them, just enough so she can come in with the cure and be the hero. Except, spoiler alert, she misjudged the dosage and Clark's wife and two of their kids die. Yikes. Naturally, the other slaves panic and hang Chloe by a tree, because that's a logical next step, apparently. And here's the kicker. Chloe's ghost never left. She's still hanging around, literally, rocking that green turban, just silently judging everyone who steps foot on the property. In fact, there's a photo from the 1990s that supposedly showed Chloe's ghost chilling outside the house like it's just another day. So Charles has given us this creepy ghost story. Two loud knocks just bang out of nowhere. Everyone in the group freezes, like we collectively decided not to acknowledge that. Let's all pretend that was normal. As we're walking through the house, the air feels thick like we're pushing through invisible cobwebs made of bad decisions. You can almost feel the weight of the stories here. Like every wall has a secret, it's dying to spill. There's a chill that moves past you sometimes, even though the air is still and muggy. Like a ghost is brushing you by on their way to, I don't know, haunt someone else. At this point, I'm starting to feel like maybe the real ghost was the anxiety I made along the way because every room feels heavier than the last. And when we finally stumble back outside, it's a relief. Except it's also pitch black and suddenly not feeling much safer. If you're feeling brave, you can take a tour of the Myrtles. And if you're feeling extra brave, you can stay overnight in one of the haunted rooms. You may get to meet Chloe, or maybe you'll just experience the general ghost weirdness that seems to permeate this place. 
Look, Chloe, she's the star of the show. Her green turban, a constant reminder of a life tragically cut short. So if you ever visit the Myrtle Plantation, keep an eye out on those shadows. You never know when Chloe or one of the many other restless spirits might make an appearance, quietly watching, still waiting for their stories to be told. New Orleans Garden District was originally a bunch of plantations, because of course it was. When the land was sold off, it mostly went to wealthy Americans who were like, yeah, we're not really feeling the vibes of living with the Creoles in the French Quarter. So they packed up their steamboats and their fancy lace parasols and moved over to what eventually became the city of Lafayette in 1833. But plot twist, in 1852, New Orleans was like, Hey, we'll take that back, thanks, and annexed it. Back in the day, the place wasn't the tightly packed neighborhood we see now. They used to have a couple of houses per block, each with a huge garden, which is why they call it the Garden District. Shocking, I know. Lafayette Cemetery Number 1 is this super old cemetery in the Garden District. Like we're talking all the way back to 1833 old. But our story begins 20 years later, in the year 1853, May 28th to be exact, when a New Orleans newspaper was like, guess what everyone, we're officially free of yellow fever. Which, you know, jinxed it immediately, because that same night an Irish immigrant died at Charity Hospital, and surprise, the fever was not done with New Orleans. By June, 50,000 people had noped right out of there, but, for the 100,000 who stayed, things got, well, very bad quickly. One in 10 died, and families were literally dropping within hours of each other. No one was left to even bury them. Lafayette Cemetery? Totally overrun. Bodies were just kind of tossed into shallow graves. And then, because this is New Orleans, it rained. Which means, yeah, the soil washed away, and rotting corpses were left out for all to see. Super chill summer vibes. By the end of it, almost 10,000 people were dead. And even though they eventually figured out that mosquitoes were the cause in 1900, it was way too late for the ghost of 1853. People say they still see spirits wandering out of Lafayette Cemetery and roaming the streets of the Garden District dazed and confused because they never got to say goodbye. So now they're stuck doomed to wander forever. So, in the heart of the Garden District, you got the Buckner Mansion, a massive house built in 1856 by Henry Sullivan Buckner, who basically wanted to one-up his business rival by building the fanciest mansion possible. Six huge columns, check. Three ballrooms, check. A garden big enough to feel like you've entered a small kingdom? Well, obviously. But you know, the usual New Orleans twist, this place is haunted. You may recognize this mansion from such places as American Horror Story Coven and your worst nightmare because, again, this place is haunted. It has a legit ghost, Miss Josephine, who was a former slave who became a governess and after she died, she just decided to stick around. Classic ghost move. People have reported hearing her sweeping in empty rooms, catching the scent of lemons, her favorite, and even spotting her chilling on the grand staircase, watching silently like she's part of the house now. And then there's the usual ghost stuff. Flickering lights, creaky doors, chandeliers swinging for no reason. Basically, the house has a whole I know things vibe. Over the years, it's been a business school, a perfume plant, and more. But no matter what it's been, Miss Josephine has always been there. Even though the current residents say they've never seen her, I feel like the house is just waiting for the right moment to bring her back. So yeah, if you're ever in New Orleans and want to visit a place where the past is just kinda hanging around, keeping things spooky, the Buckner Mansion is totally ready for you. You may not see Miss Josephine, but it sure won't feel empty. So, the Griffin House was built in 1852 by Adam Griffin, and it was supposed to be this big, fancy symbol of his wealth. Classic rich guy move. 
but then he nopes out just before the Civil War, and Union troops swoop in, turning the mansion into a barracks, a munitions depot, and, because why not, a prison. Two Confederate soldiers, caught looting, were locked up there, but instead of waiting for execution, they go full tragic ghost story and end it all in the attic with a double suicide. Super uplifting story. After the war, the Griffin House tried to have a normal life. It became a lamp factory, then a boarding house, but surprise, it's haunted. Workers and residents report hearing ghostly war songs drifting down from the attic. Plus, the sounds of boots pacing like some ghostly drill sergeant was stuck in an eternal loop. And sometimes, out of the corner of your eye, you see a Confederate soldier on the stairs, just hanging out before vanishing like a total drama queen. The house got a full restoration, and now it looks all shiny and nice. But the ghost, yeah, they're still there. The current resident claims it's totally chill now, but people say if you listen closely enough on a quiet night, you can still hear those boots stomping around and a faint, sad tune from the attic. The Griffin house might look peaceful, but it's definitely keeping some spooky secrets. The Brevard Rice House is like the quintessential Garden District mansion. Built in 1857, 9,000 square feet, giant Corinthian columns, and gardens that probably make you feel like you're on the set of some historical drama. But naturally, because this is New Orleans, it's also on it. Because of course it is. It was commissioned by Albert Hamilton Brevard, this super wealthy merchant. And he went all out with fancy stuff, like hot and cold running water, which in the 1850s was a big deal. But here's the kicker, Brevard only lived there for two years before he died inside the house. And legend has it, he never really left. Fast forward to the 1980s when Anne Rice, yes, the queen of spooky novels herself, moves in and gives the house even more of an eerie reputation. She featured it in The Witching Hour, her novel about a witch family, because why not live in a house that's already basically a ghost story? But the local lore, it's all about Brevard. People say his ghost haunts the place, and on moonless nights, this creepy mist shows up on his porch where he allegedly took his own life. Some say they've seen him pacing around, like yeah, still here. And others talk about feeling an intense, spooky vibe inside, like the house is always watching them. Even though the house was restored and sold for a couple of million in 2010, the ghost stories haven't gone away. Apparently, Brevard is still hanging around, forever tied to his fancy mansion like some kind of tragic, ultra-committed homeowner. Le Petit Theatre du Vieux Carré, nestled in the heart of New Orleans French Quarter, is a place where the past and present blend seamlessly on stage. Founded in 1916, this historic theater has been at the center of the local little theater movement, bringing art and drama to life far from the commercialization of Broadway. But beyond its long and storied history as a producing theater, Le Petit is said to be home to spirits of his own, a haunted cast that refuses to leave the spotlight. For nearly a century, Le Petit has housed performances in its iconic French Quarter building. Generations of actors, directors, and audiences have passed through its doors, but not all of them have left. Many who work or visit the theater today speak of strange encounters unexplained noises, and ghostly apparitions that linger in the shadows of the stage. One of the theater's most famous ghosts is Caroline, an actress from the 1930s who met a tragic end on the night of her performance. Dressed in a flowing white wedding gown for her role in the play, Caroline was preparing for her big moment, but in a terrible accident, she tumbled over the railing in the theater's courtyard, falling to her death below. It's said that her spirit remains at Le Petit, her ghostly figure still dressed in the white gown she never got to take off. 
Many have reported seeing her wandering around backstage or drifting through the darkened corridors of the theater as though searching for the performance she never got to finish. But Caroline isn't the only spirit haunting the halls of the Petit Theater. Some have spoken of a mysterious captain who seems to favor a particular balcony seat. He's been seen sitting quietly, watching the plays unfold before him, waiting for a glimpse of an actress he was once sweet on. The story goes that the captain fell in love with a performer many years ago, attending every one of her shows. Though she never returned his affections, his dedication was unwavering. Even in death, it seems, the captain continues to attend performances, his ghostly presence a reminder of the romance that never was. Those who have seen the captain describe him as an older man in a naval coat, his expression wistful as he stares at the stage. Sometimes, when the theater is empty, staff members hear soft footsteps on the balcony or feel a cold breeze pass by them, as though the captain is making his rounds. And though he is harmless, his presence is undeniable, a permanent fixture in the theater's rich history. Strange occurrences at Le Petit don't stop with the sightings of Caroline and the captain. Lights flicker on and off, doors open and close on their own, and whispers echo through the building late at night when no one is there. Some say it's the ghost of past performers, forever bound to the theater they love. Others believe it's simply the nature of the building so deeply tied to the drama and energy of the French Quarter. Today, Le Petit Théâtre du Vaucurie remains a vibrant part of New Orleans theater scene, hosting five main stage productions each year, as well as numerous special events and concerts. But for those who know the stories, it's not just the living who are part of the theater's audience. The spirits of the past are still present, watching from the wings, waiting in the balconies, and perhaps even waiting for their final curtain call. So if you find yourself at Le Petit one evening, enjoying the artistry and magic of the stage, don't be surprised if you catch a glimpse of a woman in a white gown or feel the presence of the captain nearby. The show, after all, must go on, whether in life or in death. After dark, LSU's campus totally transforms. It's like the second the sun dips down, these old Italian-style buildings just appear from the shadows, like they've been laying in wait for centuries. Which, okay, technically, they're from 1926, but the vibe is way older. The moon hits them just right, making everything feel ancient and heavy, like time is pressing in on you. And then there's the Mississippi, not far off, just kind of lurking. You don't hear it, but you feel it, like it's there in the background weighing down the night. These buildings, they've seen stuff. Generations of students have walked these paths, and when you walk them now, it's like you're sharing space with all those ghosts of the past. Palladian columns, the open courtyards, they're not just pretty architecture, they're basically story sponges, soaking up all the things that happened here. Old stories that hang in the air, waiting for the perfect spooky night to creep back out. And sometimes, when everything's super still, you hear footsteps. Like, real footsteps. Except, they're not yours. You stop, you listen, and it's just about dead quiet. But you know something was there. It's not exactly terrifying, but it's enough to give you that uneasy, I am not alone, feeling. Because you're not. The past is here, and it's very much hanging around, just waiting for someone to notice. Pleasant Hall used to be just another dorm, filled with the usual chaos. Students cramming for exams, the smell of cheap coffee, and that weirdly heavy silence after a long night of studying or partying. Now it's classrooms, but it's carrying something much heavier than textbooks and lectures. You can feel it, like the building knows something bad happened there, and it's never really let go. The story everyone talks about is Mike and Sue. You know the type. Young, reckless, totally in love until they weren't. Sue got pregnant, but Mike didn't want anything to do with it. He denied the whole thing, then found someone else, 
another girl living just a floor below. That's when everything broke. Sue snapped, killed Mike and his new girlfriend, then threw herself out of the third floor window. And yeah, that should have been the end of it, but it's not. People say you can still see Sue falling from that window, but she disappears before she hits the ground. Others have claimed she shows up at the foot of their beds, covered in blood, just standing there like, no thanks. There are whispers in the halls when no one's watching and that heavy, unsettling feeling like something is off. Sue's story didn't end the way it was supposed to. She's still there, stuck in the moment, haunting the quiet corners of Pleasant Hall, waiting for a piece that's never gonna come. Evangeline Hall has been around since 1930, just kind of sitting there, quietly watching as generations of students have come and gone. But it's more than just an old building with some nice vintage vibes. There's something else, something that's been hanging around for way longer than any of the students. The walls practically hung with the past. And if you're patient, or maybe just a little too alone in the dark, you may hear the whispers. The go-to story around Evangeline Hall is that it's home to three ghosts. First up, on the fifth floor, there's the janitor. No one actually sees him, but you can hear the jingle of his keys, the swish of his broom, and he's doing his rounds like it's just another night shift. Except his hands are, you know, dust. Then, on the fourth floor, there are these two girls. Their laughter <laughs> floats through the halls when everything's quiet. And when you feel that sudden icy chill that makes your skin crawl, yeah, that's them. That's not the AC. And it's not just the floors with ghosts. Across the whole building, doors open by themselves. Voices echo in the hallways, and footsteps follow you when no one's there. Some students have even brought in priests to bless their rooms. But here's the thing, these ghosts don't care. They've been here for nearly a hundred years, and they're not going anywhere. So you might want to get used to the idea of sharing your dorm with a little bit more than just your roommates. Acadian Hall looks like your classic old campus building. Ivy creeping over the bricks, a little too picturesque. Behind that, there's a history no one really talks about. It's one of those things where everyone knows something's happened, but it's all whispers and sideways glances. The story, there was a fire once, it killed some staff members, and well, they never really left. Even after the flames went out, they stayed. Now the building's quiet, but not in a peaceful way. It's that weird, uncomfortable quiet that makes you listen a little too hard, waiting for something to happen. And sometimes, something does. They say you can still see them. Men in dark suits, walking through the halls like they're on their way to somewhere important but they never get there. They just disappear before they reach the end of the hall. And then there's the girls in white. They stare at you through the windows, pale and unsettling. If you make eye contact, it's like something cold passes through you and the chill sticks around long after they're gone. Students feel it. Doors slam open in the dead of night for no reason. Furniture shifts when no one's in the room. You'll hear footsteps echoing empty hallways or whispers waking you up when everything else is dead still. Some students leave their doors open, too freaked out to be closed in with whatever's looking in there. Others just nope out entirely and move somewhere else because they can't handle it. The spirits in the Cadian Hall don't leave and they don't let you forget they're there. So, there's this massive oak on campus that has been standing for over 200 years. But because this is LSU and spooky stuff just happens here, the tree comes with a dark backstory. People say that in the 1950s, a fraternity hazing ritual went horribly wrong right beneath its branches. The pledges were blindfolded, nooses were tied around their necks. Totally normal trust building stuff, right? except one of the ropes got stuck and a pledge was left hanging too long. Despite everyone's panic attempts to save him, it was too late. 
He died under the tree. Fast forward to now, and students still whisper about it, especially on full moon nights. Some swear they've seen his ghost hanging from the oak, just swaying in the breeze like he's stuck in that terrible moment. And if you're unlucky enough to be walking by, you may hear the creak of the rope, like the tree itself is still reliving the tragedy. Welcome to Oak Alley Plantation in Vachery, Louisiana, a breathtaking, picture-perfect spot that's totally Instagram-worthy with its grand oak line path and elegant columns. But like any old southern plantation, Oak Alley comes with a chilling twist. It's not just the beauty that draws people here. Oh no, it's also the ghost. Oak Alley is considered one of the most haunted plantations in America. And really, would you expect anything less? Over the years, visitors and workers alike have reported strange occurrences. Shadows moving on their own, eerie noises in the dead of night, and an overwhelming sense of, well, being watched. One of the most famous spirits lingering around Oak Alley is Josephine Stewart, the last resident of the plantation. Picture this, workers locking up for the evening see a light flicker on in an upstairs window. They look up and there's a shadowy figure staring down at them. That's when they realize it's Josephine giving off a serious, don't mess with my house vibe. And no, that wasn't a one-time deal. Josephine still got her eyes on things. Guests and staff alike have seen her watching from the windows. It's like she's never quite left her home. Then there's the lady in black. Who is she? No one really knows, but she sure likes to make an entrance on a phantom horse, no less. No big deal, right? Just a ghostly lady casually riding under the oak trees or strolling along the porches. People say they hear the clip-clop of hooves, but when they look up, nothing, just the wind. Or is it? And if you think that's spooky, wait until you step inside. Rocking chairs that move on their own, objects being thrown by, and get this, invisible forces. During one tour, a candlestick was literally thrown across the room. Talk about an unexpected paranormal bonus for the guests. But the eeriest part, the weeping. Some have heard soft, sorrowful sobs echoing through the hallways, like the house itself is mourning the past. It's enough to give you chills. And if you're feeling brave, you can actually stay overnight in one of Oak Alley's cottages. Just know you may be signing up for a night of strange sounds, shadowy figures, and that constant feeling you're not alone. And who knows, maybe you'll catch a glimpse of the lady in black or feel Josephine Stewart's gaze from the upstairs window. But pro tip, if you hear the sound of a ghost horse coming your way, maybe don't stand in its path. You definitely don't want to become the next tell on Oak Alley's Haunted Tour. I want to personally thank you for watching this video. And here's what I want out of you. I want you to subscribe. I want you to follow. I want you to hit that, smash that like button. And I want you to share this video far and wide. And remember, it's not goodbye. It's see you next week on Gulf Coastal Connections. Yeah.